I am excited to be here to talk about effective incident response best practices. Um, my name is Julie Gunderson. I'm a DevOps advocate. You can find me at Julie underscore Gund. I'm here at PagerDuty. I'm actually in the States. I'm in Boise, Idaho. So it's nighttime. I'm sorry, it's a little bit dark in the background here, um, but really happy to be here with you all today. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the history of incidents what an incident is, and then how you can practice effective incident response within your organization. Um, so to start off, I want to talk about an incident before I jump into all the intricacies of incident response to make sure that we're all on the same playing field. <clears throat> At PagerDuty, we define an incident as any unplanned disruption or degradation of service that's effectively or actively affecting the customer's ability to use the product. So many folks also look at their internal facing disruptions as incidents, and that can be a security breach or a loss of a database or not being able to run a month end accounting close. And it's really okay if your organization doesn't have the same definition as ours, as long as you have a standard definition that's widely used throughout the organization. The key is you want to keep it simple. There's really no need to overcomplicate it. So whether you're experiencing a substantial number of failed transactions on your shopping cart page, or a large increase in processing times for lineups in your store or any other business metric that's deviated from normal behavior. That is considered an incident as your service is impacting your business in a meaningful way. And so with incident response, we want to replace chaos with calm. And think about how incident response usually goes in your organizations today. Is it, is it smooth and streamlined? Or is it 100 people on a Zoom call talking over one another? And we want more of that smooth and streamlined process than everybody talking over one another and, and chaos. Because panic and chaos is not good during an incident. It really only makes things worse and causes more confusion. And we want things to be calm and organized. So there's a saying that when your home is burning to you, it's the worst day of your life, but to the fire department, it's a Tuesday. And so the goal is to handle incidents in a way that it's just, it's a Tuesday without panic and with effective response. And so when I talk about incident response, what I'm really talking about is that organized approach to addressing and managing an incident, because the goal isn't just to solve the incident, but to handle the situation in a way that limits the damage and reduces the recovery time and costs. And the key word here is organized. And it might surprise you to learn that incident response isn't about just solving a problem. I mean, you can give a thousand monkeys a keyboard and in enough time they can solve a problem. Incident response is about solving the problem quickly while minimizing the damage and reducing that associated cost. Those are our goals. And I don't just mean financial cost. There are costs that are associated with your employees and with the people trying, they're trying to use your service or product. And so to accomplish this, you want to mobilize and inform only the right people at the right time, because you want to engage the right responders and make the resolution effort more efficient to drive down the overall time to resolve incidents. And you want to use systematic learning and improvement so that you can build off the mistakes you make and avoid them in the future. And then lastly, use total automation. We don't want to rely solely on documentation that you have to look up or research when an incident occurs. With incident response, you can make the technology work for you by setting up rules and actions to trigger automatically. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. So the basis for incident response isn't something that PagerDuty invented. It's actually heavily based on the incident command system or ICS for short, that was developed after devastating wildfires in Southern California in the 70s. So what happened is thousands of firefighters responded, but they found it difficult to work together because they knew how to fight fires individually, but they lacked the common framework to work as a larger group. And so after the fires, there were some agencies created and there were systems that were developed to manage wildland fires. And one of those became known as the, the incident command system. And then that became the national model for command structures for any major incidents. And that's used everywhere from local fire departments responding to a house fire to the US government responding to a natural disaster because it provides a standardized response that everyone is familiar with. 
And that's the reason the system is used to this day to help emergency personnel have that standardized response. And so when we talk about incidents within our businesses, it's the same thing. It's an emergency within the business and we want that organized response. And so an incident is that serious or unexpected event that requires immediate attention or action. Incidents aren't generally planned unless you're doing some form of chaos engineering and that's a whole different conversation. So that's the reason that this incident response has been so successful is because we've iterated on it over time and we continue to do so. <clears throat> so we've used the basis of having an organized approach to respond to an emergency and then we've tailored it to our needs, creating a consistent and unified approach to responding to incidents. So now that I've talked all about incidents, I haven't really talked about major incidents yet. And it's because it really varies between each organization. So at PagerDuty, our description of a major incident is any incident that requires a coordinated response between multiple teams. Um, as soon as we need to involve others, we step up our process. And what I've talked about until now is just a jumping off point for you to go back to your organization or team and brainstorm. Um, you want to have a clear definition of a major incident, just like you would of a regular incident. And that definition should be short and simple. You want, you want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. What you're going for is to remove discussion and disagreement around whether or not something is a major incident or not during your response process. If you have a metric to use for like when we're experiencing more than 100 errors per minute, it's a major incident, that's great. It's a good idea to tie it to customer impact, like saying we're experiencing a major incident when more than 5% of our customers are affected. The reason this should be your first step is that you can't respond to an incident until you know what an incident is. If one person considers something an incident, but the rest of the organization doesn't, that's going to create ambiguity and confusion during any sort of that incident response process. Having that clear definition that's disseminated to the rest of the organization makes sure that everyone has the same understanding and prevents that confusion. Now, we found that there are four commonalities with major incidents. So timing is a surprise. Major incidents often happen with little or no warning. And then time matters, so there's a need to respond quickly. Having your services degraded or down can cost your company valuable resources, money, and reputational damage. And the situation is rarely completely understood at the beginning of the incident. You're going to encounter bumps and turns of all sorts during your response process. And a major incident requires mobilizing a team of the right responders to resolve an issue and coordinating the collaboration cross-functionally. Now, typically you can determine the severity of an incident based on how drastically your metrics are affected. So as the traffic to your website drops, the severity increases. So first it starts out and maybe it's a sub five. So we use severity levels here. You might use priorities at your organization. Um, within a few moments, it becomes a sub four. And then the traffic to your site, it's continually decreasing and the severity of the incident is escalating. And now it's up to a sub three. And up until now, We've set all of these incidents to notify the on-call responder, but not to trigger a full-fledged major incident, bringing in the whole gang to coordinate the response. But let's say as this responder starts working on a SEV-3, they, they notice the problem's only getting worse. And at some point you reach a threshold, something that splits an incident from a major incident. So for us at PagerDuty, that's the difference between a SEV-3 and a SEV-2. And once we pass this threshold, that lead subject matter expert or SME triggers our incident process right away to bring in more subject matter experts. We also bring in an incident commander, a scribe, deputy, and liaisons, which I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. And again, the idea is to solve this problem in a way that limits damage and reduces those recovery times and costs. Now, you've likely already have your own levels of priority. And, and maybe they're not severities or, or they're not priorities. Maybe you just use fire emojis. That's totally fine. The thing is, a lot of the time you won't know the impact straight away. So it's important to be able to trigger the incident response process, even if the metric hasn't passed a threshold for a major incident yet. So at PagerDuty, 
we have a rule that anyone can trigger the incident response process at any time. And we encourage automatic detection and triggering within our product whenever it can be done effectively and accurately. And if an organization has reliable metrics that track customer or business impact, such as the loss of sales per minute or success rates for API calls, you should absolutely leverage that knowledge to trigger an incident response process when the threshold is crossed. That helps to reduce the time wasted on human-based assessment, and it allows you to drive down the time to resolution. But not only do we automatically kick off our major incident response process based on metrics, we encourage our humans to do this too. And it's really important for us at PagerDuty. And lowering the barrier to triggering incident response, it's actually led to a dramatic increase in the speed in which incidents are resolved. We don't want people to sit on something because an alarm hasn't gone off yet. So if customer support gets a lot of requests very quickly, it's a good sign that there's something wrong. So for instance, if an intern walks past a graph and they think it looks wrong, we want them to be able to trigger the incident response process to a major incident. So how do we let the humans trigger that process? At PagerDuty, we do it with the chat command. We use Slack. Uh, don't feel like that's the only right way. I just wanna show you how we do it to give you an idea. You can do it however you want. Use an air horn or a flashing light in the office Whatever you need, the point is you want some way to trigger your response that's fast and easy and available to everyone. Once an incident is triggered, we then need to switch our mode of thinking. We need a mentality shift. We want a distinction between normal operations and there's an incident in progress. So we need to switch that decision making from peacetime to wartime, from day to day to defending the business. So something that would be considered completely unacceptable during normal operations, such as deploying code without running any tests, that might actually be perfectly acceptable during a major incident when you need to restore the service quickly. The way you operate, your role hierarchy, and that level of risk you're willing to take it's all going to change as we make this shift. And it doesn't matter what you call it. Call it normal and emergency, okay or not okay. Again, the important lies in that you have a differentiation in those times to allow for that mentality shift in the decision-making process. It's not about what you call it. And that's why I recommend use metrics that are tied to your business impact because metrics can be very useful and often work best when they're tied to business impact. So for an example, uh, a metric we monitor at PagerDuty is the number of outbound notifications per second. At Amazon, it could be the number of orders per second. At Netflix, it's famously the number of stream starts per second, et cetera. M monitoring these important business metrics, that's going to let you use automation to determine the severity of an incident and the type of response you will use. If you use metrics that aren't tied to business impact, like CPU usage is high on a host, then it's difficult and sometimes impossible to determine the severity of an incident associated with that metric. You want a metric that lets you know how your business is doing, not how a particular piece of equipment is doing. During this mentality shift into emergency or wartime or not okay, your role hierarchy and the level of risk you're willing to take, it's gonna change. The responding teams need to have the ability to make decisions on their own to try to reduce the impact. So think of it as trying to reduce the spread of a fire. If you sit there and decide and try to weigh your options and you can't make a decision, the barn will be burnt down before you know it. So in this sense, taking no action during a time of emergency, it is an action and we call that decision paralysis. Making the wrong decision is better than making no decision because a wrong decision gives you more useful information to work with while making no decision, it, it gives you nothing. And so I want to talk a little bit about the people and the roles um, and incident categorization. So there are four steps of an incident um, during a time of emergency. And this is kind of the pattern that we follow. So when you're notified of an incident, you must first assess and triage it. And here you assess the severity and the urgency of the incident. And then next, you need to mobilize the right people who can work together towards a resolution. Remember, we don't want the 100 square Zoom call. We want to mobilize just the people that need to know. Then you work towards um, resolving and preventing. And we're working towards that common goal to resolve the incident in that quick and organized manner. And then that 
That last step is preventing the incident from happening again in the future. And that's done through the post-mortem, uh, through the post-incident review, whatever you want to call it, to learn from these incidents. And in order for these steps to happen, we want to have the right teams and roles engaged. So these are roles in incident response that we have at PagerDuty. And depending on the size of your department, the roles you can have engaged for incidents, it might vary. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss each role, and then I'll look at how you can scale these roles depending on the size of the department or team. So up until now, I've been speaking about incident response process. In order to run that, you need an incident commander. The incident commander is one of the most important roles during an incident. In fact, they're actually the highest ranked person on the incident response call. They're ranked higher than the CEO. They're the single source of truth during the incident. They're the ones in charge. They make all the decisions and no action should be performed unless the incident commander gives the go ahead. They're needed to help drive major incidents to resolution and help to coordinate the response. And the best part is they actually don't have to have deep technical knowledge. And I'll talk a little bit more of that in a, in a bit. Next up, we have the scribe. And the scribe is present during the response to document the timeline of the incident as it progresses. And they make sure that all important decisions and data are captured for later review. So you can use many different ways to record the incident response process, such as a shared document or a communication tool. At PagerDuty, we use Slack to keep an internal record of major incidents. The scribe posts in an incident response specific a public internal channel to record the live progress of the incident. And then this way we have a solid history of what was discussed and the decisions that were made. And anyone in the company can go in and read it for a status update if they'd like. So if you have Slack, I'd recommend that you have an incident response channel set up for your department or team. And you can keep it open and ongoing each time there is an incident. And that way when one occurs, you're not frantically searching for that Slack channel. Now within the command staff, we also have the deputy and they're a direct support role for the incident commander. It's not a shadow where the person just observes. The deputy is expected to perform important tasks during an incident. Depending on the size of your company or the size of the incident, the deputy can also be there to support the incident commander to help keep them focused on the issue at hand. They can act as a scribe if necessary. They can also act as um, internal liaisons for the specific incident. Which brings me then to the liaisons. Depending on the severity of the incident and the size of the department, uh, we recommend having both an internal and an external liaison. The liaisons are responsible for communicating with both the company and the external parties and customers what the impact of this incident is. So at PagerDuty, we use statuspage.io to keep the customers informed if they're handling an incident that causes a degradation of services. This is a great way to keep our customers up to date in real time. And then moving on to the operations section, when an incident occurs, that on-call responder, that SME, they're paged first without alerting the rest of the team so that they can assess the incident and decide whether or not they can resolve it on their own or if the impact is too large scale for them to solve on their own. And one of the things we say here a lot is never hesitate to escalate. So I just want to reiterate that as that initial responder, if you feel the need to escalate, do it. We don't want to waste the time debating whether or not we should escalate. And if that impact is too great and a larger amount of subject matter experts are needed, that primary on-call responder is going to page the on-call incident commander to begin the incident response process. And then that will bring in additional subject matter experts into that call. And keep in mind, this chart number of rows, ro roles, it's gonna shrink or grow depending on the size of your company and your team. I mean, I've seen some that are so vast that they take up multiple pages where you need a legend to navigate them. And we've seen and some that are quite small and precise. So you don't have to follow this exactly. This is just how we do it at PagerDuty. So when we want to set this up at scale to your department, maybe you have six or eight different teams or squads, this will change the number
goals that you have engaged, and it can scale either way. So in a department that maybe has five teams, you'll want to make sure that you have a few things set up to begin with. You want to have that on-call schedule uh, for the incident commander. And remember, that is actually team agnostic. As I said, they don't have to have deep technical knowledge. You also want to have on-call schedules for the primary and backup subject matter experts. Depending on the impact of your department, you can also maybe have your marketing, your support, or legal on rotations as well. And then you want to have a method of paging out to other team members to mobilize them. And so a typical sequence of events for an incident, when most incidents first occur, as I mentioned, the on-call responder is paged due to the automatic detection of a problem. And in most cases, they'll acknowledge and resolve the issue before it turns into a major incident. If the incident worsens and becomes a, a major incident, an escalation will be triggered. And as I mentioned, we do this through Slack, we use IC page, and that brings in an incident commander who takes control of the incident. And they come in, this is Julie, I'm the incident commander. And then that brings in the liaison team and need other subject matter experts. Now you might have a small team or squad of maybe six people and you want to scale this down. So you want to just make sure that you have that on-call schedule for the primary and backup subject matter experts and that method of paging out other team members. Now, when you look at a team of six people and you want to look at how you're going to implement this, like I mentioned, you have a primary and backup SME during this process. Um, so during this time, both the primary and the backup on call work together to resolve the incident. And if the severity of the incident is increasing, and maybe it's becoming a sub two, and it's necessary to start that incident response process to bring in the rest of the team, you bring in somebody, uh, it's recommended to have one of those folks take the incident commander position and let the other subject matter expert focus on resolving the issue. And then you can also bring in somebody to act as the scribe and everybody's working together to resolve the issue. Now, I do want to talk a little bit more about the incident commander role and responsibility patterns that we actually see as well. As I mentioned, goal is to replace chaos with calm, and that incident commander role ensures that the response is calm and organized. Other responders know what their particular role is during the response, and we want to have that existing framework for managing incidents. So remember, the firefighter analogy that I used earlier, for you, it's the worst day of your life. For firefighters, it's a Tuesday. And that goes back to the goal of replacing chaos uh, with calm. And as I mentioned, the incident commander is that most important role. Um, even if you don't have a deputy or a scribe or a customer liaison, the incident commander is the one you should get first, obviously after the subject matter expert, of course. They're the single source of truth during the incident. They're the ones in charge. They're higher rank than the CEO. They make the decisions and no action should be performed unless they give the go ahead. Once we've made a decision, we need to gain consensus for our plan. And even though I just said that the incident commander is basically a dictator and everybody should follow their instructions, that's true. But we also don't want people to come back later and say things like, well, I knew that wouldn't work. We want to stop that hindsight 2020 problem because it unmotivates responders and it wastes time. But gaining consensus amongst a large group of people it can be a bit difficult. At PagerDuty, instead of saying, saying, does everybody agree and waiting to get everybody's nods or verbal confirmations, we say, are there any strong objections? And I have to say, this also works in general meetings as well. If no one speaks up, you can implicitly get the consensus of everyone in the room and quickly move on, you know, hearing no objections. Um, that being said, do make sure to leave enough of a pause for people to raise any objections that they may have. It's not really any good asking for strong objections and then moving on immediately. At Page of Duty, we like to have the seven second rule where you count to yourself quietly for seven seconds and then hearing no objections, moving on. Once we have a collection of actions and their associated risks, it's now time to make a decision. Sometimes there's an obvious path forward with one option being clearer and better but sometimes you are presented with two equally bad options and there's really no golden rule I can give you here. It's going to be up to the context of your company culture. 
My advice is if you can't decide, literally just flip a coin. Making that wrong decision, as I mentioned earlier, is better than making no decision because no decision doesn't help any forward progress. You learn nothing new and the incident is still ongoing. Making a decision, even if it's the wrong one, is going to give you more information. And if it turns out to be wrong, you can put all of your resources into the other option. A wrong decision at least gives you more useful information and making no decision gives you nothing. And we want to avoid that decision paralysis at all costs as it can prolong your incident further. Next, you want to assign tasks to a specific person. And it's okay to assign tasks to a role like DBA on call, for example, but it must be a single individual. Assigning things to a group is a great way to make sure it doesn't get done. And what we're trying to do is avoid the bystander effect here, where we say, okay, can someone do X or Y? Folks either assume that somebody else has it covered or they just maybe don't want to do it, so they don't. And that aligns well with the incident commander's duty to coordinate and delegate rather than trying to resolve the issues. So for example, in CPR training, if you're in a mall, a crowded mall, and somebody's having a heart attack, you don't just say someone call 911. You either point to somebody specific in the crowd and say you call 911 or call somebody out by name, say, Tim, call 911. The point is you want to assign that to a specific person, otherwise it won't get done. And I've said it over and over, the incident commander is the highest authority, no matter what their day-to-day -day role is. An incident commander outranks the CEO. And if a CEO joins, the incident commander outranks them. And the important thing here is that that information is disseminated through your organization and that leadership has buy-in because you don't want a CEO finding out that they're outranked on a call during an incident call. And it's critical for success in incident response that the executives buy into this. And whether this works for you, it's gonna depend on your organization. So this is how we do it at PagerDuty and it works well for us, but I can imagine it can't always be 100% easy to get this sort of buy-in in other organizations. Importantly about the incident commander is they're not actually working to resolve the incident. They're coordinating and delegating all the tasks. They shouldn't be looking at logs or graphs or logging into servers. They're there to help coordinate and delegate on the call. And that can be hard sometimes if an engineer becomes an incident commander as they may naturally want to jump in and try to help, but that urge must be resisted at all costs. And if they do need to jump in and help, they need to hand off incident command to somebody else. As I mentioned before, for incident commanders, deep technical knowledge, it actually isn't required. So we used to require that all of our incident commanders were experienced engineers with deep technical knowledge of all of the PagerDuty systems. And it was actually one of our bigger mistakes. Remember the incident commanders aren't responders. They aren't the ones actually fixing the problem. So they don't need deep technical knowledge. However, there should be a basic understanding of the organizational foundation. So if someone's new to PagerDuty and they don't uh, know what PagerDuty notifications are, that could be an issue. Incident commanders are experts at coordinating the response and not solving technical issues. The, you should be relying on your subject matter experts for solving the issues. Removing the restriction of the deep technical knowledge, it actually led to a dramatic increase in our pool of available incident commanders, and it didn't have any effect on our ability to respond to incidents. And now we have incident commanders from all across the organization, and we always have them in training. I mean, it's already hard enough to get people to want to be an incident commander, so don't add any unnecessary restrictions to your pool if you don't have to. And then the last tip for incident commanders for right now would be to conduct a regular handoff. It's a very important process to ensure that the response continues to move smoothly and that there's only one incident commander on the call at a time. And depending on your organization, you'll have a different threshold at which you decide to complete a handover. And maybe it's after the incident's been ongoing for two hours or three hours. Choose a time frame that works for your organization. In general, handing over command is actually quite easy. You can privately message with the new incident commander to get them up to speed. They can read all of those scribe notes to see what action has been taken so far. And then on the call, you announce that you'll be handing over incident command duties to the new person, and then you get to drop off the call. 
And this also helps ensure that there are fresh eyes on the incident and they can continue to help navigate through that incident without any interruptions. Now, typically, the incident commander is following this feedback loop while communicating with their subject matter experts. And we just keep following this pattern until the incident is resolved. You ask for a status from your experts, you decide on an action based on what you're told, you gain consensus for the plan, assign the task out, and you follow up once the tasks are done, and then repeat. More generally, we're following this cycle for each incident. So we're sizing up the situation, we're stabilizing things in the loop I just showed, keeping everyone updated as to what's going on. And then we verify the situation is fixed before ending the response. If it's not fixed, we start again. And so just to cover some of those quick tips for the incident commanders, introduce yourself on the call with your name that you're the incident commander. This is actually a psychological trick. Using your name here reminds people that you're a human. Avoid acronyms at all costs. Look, they get messy and they end up wasting time instead of saving time because they're oftentimes misunderstood. Speak slowly and with a purpose. It's better to speak more clearly than worrying about being concise. On the call, kick people off if they're being disruptive or derailing a solution, even if they're an executive. And I'm going to talk about some ways to do that. Time box tasks and check back with the responsible team members to ask for a status update. Um, specifically, assign tasks to specific people. You want to also very specifically declare when the incident response process has ended. So in summary, the incident commander keeps everyone focused on the call. They keep the decision making moving forward. They're avoiding that bystander effect and they keep things moving towards a resolution. Now, I've talked a lot about Incident Commander, and as I mentioned, there are some other roles within Incident Commanders. So there's the scribe and the deputy, the liaisons, and then the subject matter experts. So the deputy, as I mentioned before, is that direct support role for the incident commander. It's not the shadow, they're not observing. It's important for the incident commander to focus on the problem at hand rather than worrying about documenting the steps or monitoring those time box tasks. And the deputy does anything they can to help take some of the work off of the incident commander's shoulders that they might have to do otherwise without them there. The deputy helps to support the incident commander by taking on any of those unnecessary tasks with the goal of helping that incident commander stay focused on the incidents. And some examples of this may be keeping time for assigned tasks or circling back to missed items, paging in other responders to join the incident call, or doing non-technical investigative work based on the incident commander's input. They also are basically a hot standby for the incident commander should the primary either need to transition to that subject matter experts or otherwise have to step away from that incident command role. Um, the deputy should definitely be cross-trained as an incident commander, and any incident commander can also act as a, a deputy. And then the scribe is documenting the timeline of an incident as it progresses to make sure that all of the important decisions and data are captured for later review. They're not a court stenographer. The first time I ever scribed on a crawl, I tried to take every word down verbatim. That's not necessary. They're really there as a record keeper, adding additional context and capturing important follow-up information in the official incident record. As I mentioned, we do this in Slack. However you do it, whether or not it's a shared document, whatever works best for your organization, ideally it's not through email. Since the incident commander needs to focus on the problem at hand and the subject matter experts are focused on resolving the incident, that timeline of information still needs to be captured. The events as they happen so that they can be reviewed during the postmortem to determine how well we performed and what can we learn from this incident. And so that we can accurately determine any additional impact that we might not have noticed at the time. So the scribe is expected to do things like ensure the incident call is being recorded and note in Slack, which I mentioned that we use important data and events and actions as they happen. Status reports, they need to note those when one is provided for, by the incident commander and any key callouts during the call or at the ending review. And anyone can act as a scribe during an incident and they're usually a role that's assigned by the incident commander at the start of the call. 
Typically, the deputy will act as a scribe um, in smaller calls, but that doesn't necessarily need to happen. Uh, for larger incidents, it's definitely a role that you want to break out. They also remind the team to follow up on issues discovered during the incident in the form of to do action items documented in that official transcript. And the scribe should also monitor tasks assigned to responders by the incident commander and remind the incident commander to follow up on any tasks as necessary. And then the liaisons. So the communications liaisons, they're the link to your customers and your stakeholders throughout the incident. It's important for the rest of the command staff to be able to focus on the problem at hand rather than worrying about crafting the messages to the customers. And this can be an all-in-one type role or sometimes it gets broken out into two roles, one for customers and one for internal stakeholders. So a customer liaison is the primary individual in charge of notifying your customers of current conditions and informing the incident commander of any relevant feedback from customers as the incident progresses. The customer liaison, they should listen to the call and they should watch that incident room to keep track of what's going on and how far the incident is progressing. They should also track incoming customer support requests to understand and report on customer impact that the incident is having. The customer liaison role is really well filled by somebody from the support team as they're already used to communicating with customers and can generally get that information out to them. Now, the internal liaison is in charge of notifying internal stakeholders of current conditions and informing the incident commander of any relevant feedback from the internal stakeholders as the incident progresses. Um, as a PagerDuty customer, if you're using the modern incident response process, that is a function you can automate. But if you can't automate that, the person in this role should be someone who's aware of the appropriate internal channels for getting those updates out. So generally not somebody that you hired last week. In either role, the incident commander will actually instruct you to create notification messages to keep these parties updated at various points throughout the call. And they'll be required to craft the message, then gain approval for the incident commander from the incident commander, and then disseminate that message either to customers or stakeholders. Now I wanna take just a few minutes to talk about pitfalls that we've seen and how to overcome those. So, Executive swoop is a class of problem that, well, we actually call executive swoop and poop, but PagerDuty doesn't love it when I put that on the slide. Um, I want to look at some of the common examples of executive swoop in the next few slides that I have. And it's worth noting that none of these happen maliciously. No executive joins with the intent of hindering the process. They're trying to motivate people and to find out what's going on because it's their business too. Making sure that your executives know why these things are a problem is important. So be sure to follow up after an incident if some of these things happen. So I'm sure we've all been there and we've seen this. The let's try and resolve this in 10 minutes. And on the surface, it seems pretty benign, right? The executive is just trying to motivate the staff and encourage them to solve the problem quickly. Unfortunately, that's not how others on the call will interpret it. Instead, they're more likely sarcastically thinking, well, you know, I was going to take an hour, but since you said 10 minutes, I'll do it in 10 minutes. What this really does is it assumes that people aren't already working as hard as possible to solve the problem, and it can really demotivate responders and add additional stress. So the job of the incident commander is to nip this type of behavior in the bud and keep things on track. Another one that you've definitely never heard before is when an executive joins the call and they want to get a list of all the impacted customers. The problem is in order to find that out, we need to take someone away from the effort of responding to the incident at a time when we need them most. And it turns out you can generally just tell the executive that. We can either focus on resolving on the incident or we can get you that spreadsheet. What would you like? And then Oftentimes executives, they hop on that incident response call and they begin asking a lot of questions around a specific customer impact and, and they'll come in asking for something large and time consuming. And just again, make sure to tell them that, yeah, I can work on that or I can solve the problem, but we can't do both. If you have somebody that just won't stop, one of the best things that you can do as an incident commander is just say, do you wish to take command? And you can watch how quickly they don't answer with yes. And if this person comes back and answers with yes, great, you're off the hook. You can say, everyone on the call, be advised. I'm handing over command to X, peace out, mic drop and walk away. 
Most of the time though, they generally will either say no or not answer at all, in which case you can continue on as normal. And you can even say in that case, remember that I'm in command of this incident. Please save discussions for after the call. The reason that we see this class of problem is failing to keep these stakeholders informed. You want to keep stakeholders informed on a, the regular cadence because transparency is key. It helps make sure that people don't feel the need to join that call. And it allows your stakeholders to field questions from customers so that the team isn't interrupted because you're giving the organization confidence that the situation is under control. Now, other issues that we see are too frequent status updates. Some organizations, they want status updates out every five minutes, but too many status updates, they waste time and they're usually unnecessary. At PagerDuty, we keep our internal updates to once every 30 minutes or immediately when a change occurs, which you know generally is improvement or resolution. And red herrings, these, these are things, especially clues that are misleading or distracting. Like, I've been on a call where everyone was convinced there was a network problem. However, after some time, we realized we hadn't checked the recent deploys and the SOSA of the problem was a code change, which they usually are. So don't get sucked into obsessively following one line of investigation and miss the true cause of the incident. And the incident commander helps by asking questions and encouraging the team to step back and look at options. And so some of the other anti-patterns are debating the severity of an incident during a call. That's why we want to have those defined definitions at the start so that we aren't wasting time. Or discussing process and policy designs during the incident call. Not disseminating policy changing. Hesitating to escalate to other responders. Also, neglecting the postmortem and follow-up activities is a really big one. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about postmortems. And for that incident commander, when they try to take on multiple roles, it distracts them from keeping that call on track. And then getting everybody on, in the organization on the call. At three o'clock in the morning, when you're on an incident call with everybody else in the organization, it becomes incredibly costly and incredibly chaotic. Also, forcing everyone to stay on the call. If someone isn't needed, let them off the call. You can just say, Adele, you can go ahead and get off the call. If you need Adele back, you can page her back in to the call. And also assuming silence means no progress. So we've seen this before where somebody hops on the call, it's silent, and then they start to ask a lot of questions. Silence just generally means that people are focusing on the work at hand. So now how do you prepare for a major incident? First, you want to create those standardized definitions for the incident. As I mentioned at PagerDuty, we define the incident as any unplanned disruption or degradation of service that's actively affecting the customer's ability to use the product. And you can look at your internal um, facing disruptions as incidents. You want to practice. You want to practice running major incidents as a team. So at PagerDuty, we practice uh, chaos engineering in the form of failure Fridays where we purposely inject failure and spin up an incident. This helps the team practice. It enables those responders to act in a calm and collected manner. And that way you'll be ready for when the real thing hits. I mean, going back to the firefighter analogy that I keep using, if a firefighter only fought one or two small fires a year and then they're suddenly called to a huge forest fire, they're most likely less likely to act calm and cool and collected. Instead, they'll be frantic and often that leads to rash decisions. So another great way to practice is if you have an incident that's downgraded in severity, go ahead and run through it anyway as a major incident because you'll learn how your response process worked and you'll be able to tune your systems better so that you're not triggering major incidents when they're less severe. That's why we run um, Failure Fridays here at PagerDuty in the form of chaos engineering to get this practice in. You're also looking for process improvements and stakeholder expectations and, and disruptions that could trickle down to responders or rise up to stakeholders. Find ways to tune your processes so that you can look at ways that you can make things more smooth. And make a checklist that you can run through during an incident uh, to have your bases covered. So if you think about pilots, no matter how many times they have flown, they have that pre-flight checklist. Because during stressful situations, 
even those simple steps, they can get forgotten because it's three o'clock in the morning. You've just woken up. I'm not going to read this example checklist to you. You can find it at response.pagerduty.com. The point is checklists reduce the strain on remembering those small tasks that can have a really large impact. And don't neglect the postmortem. To start off, the person that's completing that postmortem, they're going to write a detailed timeline of events. They're going to run through a timeline of what happened during the incident response process. And this is where those scribe notes are very, very helpful because you're following a detailed recounting of events that the team can then discuss. So just a little bit about postmortems uh, for, for, for beginners, for all of you. You want to have um, an overview. So that's a high level of the impact, one to two sentence of what happened, which is generally a couple of paragraphs, which is a detailed description of what happened. Um, and that can include the root cause and the resolution and the impact. So who did this affect, by how much, for how long. You want to include what went well, what didn't go well, and action items. And if you don't have any action items, then what was the point of having that response? Um, you want to have your postmortems for internal messaging and then for external that's directed to your customer base or group, that's going to be a sanitized version of your internal postmortem. These bullets on the screen, this is just an absolute minimum of what you should cover. And um, if you're not accustomed to performing postmortems, you can definitely read postmortems.pageduty.com where we talk about blameless postmortems and things that you should include in those. And then I'm not going to read this slide to you, but here's a more detailed look at what you can include in your postmortems. The way we look at it, the more information, the better. That way, when you're looking back at the incident in the future, you have the entire context of the situation and you can better understand why decisions were made. So in summary, use the incident command system for managing incidents because it removes the chaos and brings a lot of organization and calm to the incident. Um, an incident commander should take charge during those wartime scenarios. They are not supposed to be resolving the incident or working towards uh, technically resolving the incident. They're there to keep that call focused. You want to set any expectations upwards. As I mentioned, an executive should not find out on the call that the incident commander is higher ranked than them. You do want that executive buy-in. You want to work with the team to ensure that those explicit processes and expectations are there and laid out. And don't forget to practice. Practice is key. So whether or not you do that as part of a chaos engineering experiment, or as I mentioned earlier, running through um, a, a, a downgraded incident as a major incident, you can do that. And then don't neglect the postmortem. You definitely don't want to forget to learn from these incidents because incidents are learning opportunities and we want to embrace that. Now, for more information on incidents, you can visit response.pageduty.com. And there's also a copy of this uh, training on there if you want to share that with anybody in your organization. And I also want to mention that we have PagerDuty Summit coming up uh, at the end of June. So you can go ahead and scan this QR code and save the date. And then um, I do have just a couple of minutes for questions. If there are any, you can either pop them in the chat or in the Q&A. I think we have just a couple of minutes left. And as I'm looking in the chat, apparently, don't forget to swing by the PagerDuty booth because you can win an iPhone 12, which is also very important. Um, you can also hit me up on Twitter at Julie underscore Gun, And you can also reach out to us in the community forums at community.pagerduty.com if you have any other questions or want to follow up with anything there. And so with that, if there aren't any strong objections, I'll go ahead and, uh, and end this session. And I just want to say thank you all for being here. And again, you can find us at the PagerDuty booth. You can check out uh, this ops guide at response.pagerduty.com. You can scan this QR code to find us at Summit. And uh, thank you all again for being here today.